day two of the Global Air and Space Chiefs Conference. I'm delighted to be here again. We have another really full morning of debate, and I'm really pleased to say we will have um, some defense, security, air and space power senior leaders joining me here on the stage to discuss some of the issues that we've already been focusing on uh, during the conference yesterday. Uh, so without further ado, I am very delighted uh, to introduce the Minister for Armed Forces and Veterans for the UK, the Right Honourable James Heapy MP. So please do give him a warm welcome. Um, thank you all very, very much indeed. I, I'm conscious that somewhere there must be a website that still has the wrong job on it, because this happened at Chatham House and at Rusi the other week. I lost the veterans brief very sadly um, last September, so I am now devotedly back to being the Minister of State for the Armed Forces, but there is plenty to be doing in that brief, given all that is going on in the world. Um, I wanted to, um, to just sort of talk... Um, quite candidly with you to open the, uh, the thing today, not least because I've had to clear a lot of the speeches that you'll get on the British side, and they're all very scripted, and I thought if I were to do the same, I'd be inflicting unnecessary pain on you. Um, I'm conscious that almost all of you tomorrow are off for an orgy of technology and kit and noise um, down in Gloucester. And so I wanted to um, start by reflecting on our people and five groups of people in particular because I think there's a tendency in these conferences and particularly in your domain which is so technologically demanding to default to the shopping list, the kit, the planes, the missiles. And I just want to mention what I've seen as I've gone round the RAF over the last year because Times of heightened geopolitical tension in Europe have brought with them ever more probing of our airspace. And so those pilots on quick reaction alert, a job that on the face of it might seem incredibly glamorous, from bed to Mach 2 inside about three minutes, amazing, other than it is an extraordinary thing to ask people to do day in, day out, hour after hour, irrespective of children's birthdays, Christmas, summer holidays. It is an amazing thing that they do. And I saw somewhere that the QRA output has doubled over the last year. And that's an amazing achievement because that is not just a testament to the pilots, but also to the amazing engineers who I had the pleasure of meeting at Lossy Mouth a few months ago and at Coningsby a year or so ago. And they are the people that keep the show on the road. There is a zero failure policy on QRA, and our engineers are amazing for the way that they keep delivering that capability at time of heightened challenge. So too, out of sight, out of mind, is the mission on Operation Shader, both those who are flying Typhoon out of Cyprus, but also those who are flying remotely piloted systems out of Waddington. Day after day, they are on operations, and reasonably regularly, they're delivering lethal effect. Then there's the amazing TAC AT fleet, the A400s, Herks, who were involved in the evacuation from Sudan. When we were sat in the MOD looking at the way that Sudan was worsening and realizing that the embassy needed evacuation, there were some extraordinary options being considered when it wasn't clear whether there was an airfield immediately nearby that we would be able to get to, when it wasn't clear whether or not we were going to be able to get to the diplomats before they ran out of food and water, when it wasn't clear how on earth we were going to get out the thousands of UK citizens that we had an obligation to evacuate. And the way in which that fleet was able to quickly plan around a number of different scenarios was amazing. And then, of course, as we saw in Kabul a few years ago, the courage and the professionalism, the expertise that has to be shown by that first plane that's going to land on a runway that no one's landed on from the Royal Air Force before. You don't know whether you're going to be welcomed or shot at. Quite amazing. And then the compassion that the RAF crews show as they bring people out 
from a point of mortal danger to safety. Amazing people that did an amazing job. And then probably the people that have impressed me the most this year in terms of people a bit like submariners who do something that is so special, so secret, that invariably they're not spoken about. But when I went to Waddington and met the absolute ninjas that sit on the consoles at the back of Rivet Joint and know everything that Suravikin is thinking before his staff do, they are amazing. And they are doing a job that is incredible. And of course, it's not just that they have been gathering intelligence. In the last 12 months or so, weapons were released in the vicinity of one of those aircraft, and yet those crews kept on going. They are amazing people, brilliant at what they do, undoubtedly a part of the UK's strategic advantage. And then finally, a group of people who will be amazed to hear themselves spoken about at the front end of a speech when I'm talking about points of operational excellence within the Royal Air Force. But there are some amazing, cunning, devious, brilliant people at the Air and Space Warfare Center who have sat themselves down in rooms with towels over their head and have thought up brilliant ways to deceive some of the most sophisticated air defense systems in the world and to pass relatively inexpensive systems quickly to the Ukrainians in order to be able to defeat what would on paper be a numerically superior air force. And I'll come back to that theme later on. But right up front, before you go down to Fairford and enjoy industry champagne and marvel at technology, there are some brilliant people, engineers, pilots, intelligence analysts, innovators, who really keep the show on the road. And it is to them that I want to say the biggest thank you and to pass on our admiration. Um, now, slightly sensitive issue, but the reality is that to achieve all of those things, the Royal Air Force needs incredible cognitive diversity. And that requires a recruitment policy to deliver cognitive diversity. There's no doubt we know that over the last 12 months, the Royal Air Force has got some of that wrong. But unfairly, wrongly, disgracefully, we've allowed the Air Force, I think, at times to be characterized as having gone soft. And yet, actually, what I've just described to you as an operational output across QRA in the Gulf, air policing across NATO, intelligence gathering in the Black Sea, flying into potentially hostile airfields in Sudan, being integral to the delivery of storm shadow to the Ukrainian Air Force and innovating in order to defeat Russian air defense. That's not a service that's gone soft. That is a service that is up threat and often delivering lethal effect day in, day out. The Royal Air Force is, and my apologies to other chiefs in the room, but the Royal Air Force is without doubt, in my opinion, the most cunning, most professional war fighting air force in the world. But the challenge is that we need to keep our brilliant people. And too many of them are leaving. The engineers that I have seen working so brilliantly on flight lines, whether that be on operations or here in the UK, are tired. They've been on tour rotations that are four months on, four months off. And the difficulty is at the moment we have no answer to keep them in service other than to keep encouraging them to keep going. And so I commend to you the Haythorne Thwaite Review if you've not read it, or read it already. It's the first time since the 1990s with the Betts Review that we've actually asked that the whole terms and conditions of service for the UK Armed Forces be looked at in the round. There are some brilliant recommendations in there that I think will help to incentivize and retain our people better, that recognize that they want to build their careers differently. And I'm confident 
that if we deliver Haythornthwaite in the way that we plan, and you'll see lots of it in the Defense Command paper refresh that comes out next week, we will have an offer to our people that will keep those that we need in service for longer and help them to feel better rewarded. It's an incredibly important thing that we must do. Now, I also have read in the last few months that because neither side has got air superiority in Ukraine, somehow perhaps air superiority isn't as fundamental as we thought that it is. I reject that notion completely, and I suspect that every single person in this room does too. Russia must rue that it thought it would achieve air superiority in one night. And when they didn't achieve air superiority in one night, rather than keeping going with their air campaign until they did, they got on with their ground campaign nonetheless as scheduled. And the rest is history, because in what should have been in their planning a three-day operation, 505 days later, they still haven't achieved any of their strategic objectives. If they had achieved air superiority before they began the ground campaign, I have no doubt that what we would have been supporting over the last 18 months or so would have been a resistance campaign, an insurgency within Ukraine, rather than the incredible defense of their territory that we've seen. Inescapably, mission success on ground depends on superiority first in the air. But what does that mean in the wake of what we've seen in Ukraine? Well, I don't think it means just having more planes than the other side. I don't necessarily think it means being more technologically advanced than the other side, although very obviously both of those things help. Because in Ukraine, what we've seen is this amazing ability where if you apply military cunning and you bring together systems of things, some of which are third generation, some are fourth, some might be touching fifth, highly complex weapons against, alongside less sophisticated platforms, or not particularly complicated weapons and, si weapons and platforms, but all wrapped up in highly sophisticated decoys and electronic warfare and other things to confuse and overwhelm the systems on the other side. Actually, what you see is that the sum of the system is often greater than its parts. And our tendency, I fear, when we look at procurement policy certainly in the UK MOD, and you can judge for yourself, our international guests, whether it's the same in yours, is the shopping list that comes up is all about individual platforms. Very, very rarely is it about the thing, the glue, the grease, that makes the system work and brings together all those platforms, because that's where the overwhelming effect comes. And that, as I said when I mentioned the Air, Air and Space Warfare Center people, that's when you can really bring the genius of your people to bear. There's fantastic expertise within industry who will deliver you brilliant platforms, no doubt. But I guess that by the time you end up in a war with a peer, you're broadly facing off against kit that is equally capable on both sides. And so the genius is in the way that you bring together the system, the way you innovate, the way you are cunning. And that's exactly what's been happening in Ukraine. And we need to bring that out of the dark rooms of the Air and Space Warfare Center for the team that is supporting Ukraine and make that an absolute core to the way that we design our force within the Royal Air Force. Um, it does, however, require some integration. And it requires integration in a way that I think we should have lots of sympathy for the Chief of the General Staff, the First Sea Lord and the Chief of the Air Staff, because arguably that level of integration is quite existential. Because effect in air and space increasingly will be had from land, sea, and cyberspace. Just as effect on land will be had from the sea and from the air and from space, and effect at the sea will be had from the air and from the land and from cyberspace too. So that necessity of integration means that all of a sudden there's no longer Rich's shopping list for the Air Force, Patrick's shopping list for the Army, Ben's shopping list for the Navy. There's the nation's shopping list for a highly integrated, multi-domain set of armed forces where it doesn't matter whether the sensor is in space, in the sky, on land, on the sea, or under the sea, nor does it matter whether the effector is in space, in the sky, on land, on the sea, or under the sea. What matters is that a sensor within a system has found the enemy, 
an algorithm has quickly processed which is the most appropriate effector, and then that effector is launched. There's still a need for a Royal Air Force, an army, and a navy, because you have to have those sensors on land, sea, and air, and that requires domain-specific expertise to deliver. But the system is not the air forces. The system is not the armies. The system is not the navies. The system is an integrated whole of defense force, and that surely is to get to my point earlier about it's about the cunning and the ingenuity of the system and the way that it interacts and is integrated. That's what we've got to start aiming for, and that's what our procurement policy needs to start reflecting, and that too may or may not be in the command paper next week. The final thing I wanted to touch on, because there's a menacing clock in front of me that is ticking down and says I've already not got enough time, but I'm on the roll, um, <laughs> is that there's a technology threshold rapidly approaching. Now, I've asked some of the brilliant people who serve as non-executive directors within defense and in the single services, what, should, what do the best businesses do when they know that there's a technology threshold approaching? Do you wait? knowing that you could be the first to get there with the new technology, or do you go for it now and know that you might risk obsolescence as soon as the technology comes? Now, in fairness, what they say first of all is that, James, great question, but you guys are completely unique in procuring on 20 or 30-year timelines, and when you say something's going to take 30 years, it ends up taking 40. No business functions like that. So in one sense, we can't necessarily learn their lessons, but they are clear you cannot afford to be paralyzed by the proximity of a technology threshold. So whilst we all know, and I suspect you've had lots of conversation already, and you'll have more today, and when you get down to Fairford, industry will be selling like bilio around AI, automation, and all of the opportunities that come with. But it's not quite there yet. So we have to carry on procuring with what we need now. But there is very obviously something that we must do. And that is to make sure that instead of our platforms being so highly integrated and sophisticated by design and at build, that they are what they are for the entire duration of their service, we have to be brutal in working out which are the critical flight safety systems that must be completely integrated and everything else must be easily ripped out and replaced. And for me, AI, automation, they are opportunities that come from the really big threshold, and that is the arrival of quantum. And the danger is that the generation of planes that we will be sold at Fairford over the next 72 hours, none of them have quantum computing in yet. All of them will be in service when quantum computing arrives. So we have to be able to buy aircraft, design aircraft, where the moment that those computers are good to go, you can rip out whatever's in there and chuck in the quantum computer. Because I think that this is a tanks versus cavalry, machine guns versus humans moment. I think this is going to change warfare in the most profound way. Because at the moment, the thing that holds us back from being able to understand where a target is in the entire noise of the battle space is our ability to crunch the data. Very often it comes back to human judgment. But when those computers, instead of computing on ones and zeros, are computing on atoms, and the vastness of the noise of the ocean, or the vastness of the business of the skies, or the vastness of everything that's happening within a human population on land, can be un understood and crunched by computers that are working at a speed that we can't imagine, it will enormously change what our armed forces can do. And we've got to be ready to spiral onto our machines when that moment comes. And that's the key. In the past, you could go into the pavilions at Farnborough or Fairford, and you could be shown a plane, and you could have some confidence that in the life of that plane, it would start off being ahead of its time. And in the middle third of its service, it would be of its time. And in the rear third of its service, it would still be competitive with most other air forces, and all would be fine. But the pace of innovation is now such that within the first third of the, of the service of most of the platforms that we will procure, technology will pass them by. And so I think we have to force ourselves to get into this place where we take intelligence about what our adversaries are doing, 
science that is emerging from within defense science and technology, but also from academia and within industry. We have to be speaking to industry about how they would innovate with that intelligence and that science. And then we have to apply military cunning to how we intend to use that system. And that spiral loop of intelligence, science, innovation, and military cunning, I actually think that's the battle-winning edge of the future. In Ukraine at the moment, some capabilities, particularly in the electronic warfare space, have a burn time of about 10 to 12 weeks. You'll put a UAS into service for the Ukrainians. It'll take about six weeks for the Russians to figure out why it can fly through their EW screen, and another six weeks for the Russians to figure out how to reprogram their EW or to put something new into their EW platforms to defeat it. And then you go again. And so that loop in contact between sorties of being able to reprogram, to take intelligence, science, innovation, and military cunning to maintain your edge constantly, I think that every bit as important as your mass, as your courage, as the coherence of your command and control and, to, and the sort of traditional things that define military supremacy. Increasingly, it's also the speed at which you can spiral in contact to, and that requires a whole new relationship between the force, industry, science, and that too also might be in the command paper. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the rest of your conference and enjoy being sold everything at Fairford. Good to see you. We've got a few questions. Thank you very much. Um, it's really fascinating. I mean, you covered obviously a lot of topics there. Um, I think just want to hone in a lot of the, the subjects that we've, we've been covering during this conference and that have come loud and clear um, from the audience is the concern that um, there isn't going to be enough resources dedicated towards a meaningful deterrent going forward in the case of Russia. Uh, we've heard from Professor Justin uh, Bronk saying, look, um, perhaps NATO and Europe is underestimating Russia's resolve going forward. And you can only really tackle this over the long term to have security over the longer term um, by ensuring that industrial capability and capacity really is ramped up to a scale that we're just simply not doing right now. What would you to say to that? I mean, I think that's broad, the latter part is broadly right. I think that the, um, I think that NATO's collective air, sea, land power is overwhelming to Russia. Uh, and there is, it's, it's clear that, NATO, that Russia doesn't want to see the war spread because it knows if it were to find itself in an Article 5 moment, it would lose and lose quickly. Um, I'm conscious I've managed to leave a chair here, which means you're staring at the back of the chair. <laughs> there we go. Um, but the, the, um, there's a... So I, I think that NATO combined has the conventional deterrence. So there's a sort of... There's a thing sometimes to forget about the fact that we are in the world's most powerful military alliance and that we contribute on the leading edge of that alliance. No one requires the Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy, the British Army to be able to fight Russia alone. That's the reason we are in NATO. And I think collectively that conventional deterrence is, is overwhelming. But your commentator was absolutely correct that very quickly a second key line of activity opened up in the UK MOD in how we were trying to support Ukraine. It wasn't just to do with the immediate delivery of munitions from our own stockpiles or our ability to buy munitions from other people's stockpiles elsewhere around the world. It was realizing that our industrial base really matters and that that's where the war fighting capacity really comes from. Now look, that's not new. Our grandfathers and grandmothers knew that because whenever you fight a war, MODs deliver the first echelon force into the first phase of the fight. Hasn't, Nations fight wars thereafter. But hasn't the time scale of what you've been planning for at the Ministry of Defence diminished? For example, planning for more of a six-month conflict rather than a conflict that which will go on for a lot longer, which is what we are seeing. No, I don't think it has. I mean, I think that there's, a, there's an understanding that you make a calculation around the stockpiles you hold that are to get you through the first phase of the war. And nobody's made any secret of the fact that the stockpiles we currently hold are insufficient 
to do that. And so we're seeking we to regrow that? well, regrowing them. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's announcements about stockpiles in the command paper next week as well. Who knows? Um, but uh, I, but but there is then this thing about the stockpile is only half of the equation. You've also got to have either the defense industrial base or the wider civilian industrial capacity that can be repurposed because the stockpiles are supposed to last you until such time as your production equals your consumption in war. Now, that is a huge challenge that requires more than just Ministry of Defense policy. That's a whole of government thing. But when you're in a post-industrial, largely service economy, that's quite challenging. So that doesn't mean necessarily we need to regrow home industry, but it needs to means we need to think very carefully around accounting practices. Where for we, example, not penalising for stockpiles. Oh, I mean, you make something. Uh, maybe, maybe that's probably more for the permanent secretary. I was going to go for more geopolitics. Um, so you thinking about nearshoring and where in the world you can have a manu you know, If you're not going to have the manufacturing base at home for your own industry, but you want to be, you know at time you need to be able to surge your industrial capacity. Who are your friends? How defensible is that sea and air line of communication to bring that stuff from the point of manufacture to the UK? We've got great experience of keeping the North Atlantic open, which is great, but actually where else in Africa, in the Middle East, could we have air manufacturing partnerships? So those are the things we don't yet have the answers to, definitely, but it is inescapably necessary to both A, look at the size of your stockpiles, but B, look at how you scale industry quickly to meet the challenge of a national war. Great. So you talked as well about the fact we, we, we don't know yet what is, is going to be in the plan, um, but from, from your speech, you, you talked a lot about kind of greasing uh, the wheels and ensuring that, you know, there is um, you know, a whole force concept. Um, but in many ways, it seems as though this is very much geared at battlefield support rather than long-term deterrence. And they're integral. They are literally the same thing. So just in the most crude sense, when Jim Hockenhull at the time was chief defense intelligence and we were sat in the Mountbatten room, which is that kind of top secret meeting room, in the weekends running up to the war, with the intelligence was clear it was going to happen. And for the things Jim was looking for was not tank ships or planes, it was bridging assets. It was hospitals, bloodstocks, plasma. You know, those are the, like, the credibility of your war fighting capability isn't in a whole load of tanks parked up in Wiltshire or planes on a flight line in Coningsby or ships in Portsmouth. The thing that makes your war fighting capability resilient and therefore credible and therefore a genuine deterrence is your adversary knowing that you can genuinely fight them. But once you've got to that stage, you know, that's the stage you don't actually want to get to, isn't it? I mean, actually, it's the, it's the worst possible stage to get to. Really, as we've been discussing here, it is better to have the deterrence rather than be forced into the quagmire of war as it is currently. No, I completely agree, but we're in vigorous agreement. So what I'm saying is that you're not going to deter anybody just by having lots of frigates, lots of typhoons, and lots of Challenger 2 or Challenger 3 tanks. No one's deterred by that. What they're deterred by is the credibility of your ability to put those tank ships and planes into the fight and then to sustain them once they're in the fight. It's your ability to bring together all of those systems to have overwhelming lethal effect in an integrated way as I was describing. That's what we've seen in Ukraine. It would be the same in any other war. Now, I make no criticism of the governments that have gone before, of all colours. You know, if you read the reviews from the public account, or the reports of the Public Accounts Committee or the House of Commons Defence Committee from the early 2000s, they were critical about the enormity of MOD stockpiles, critical about the profligacy of logistics chains that were held in triplicate or more. Because in a post-Cold War, no obvious state-on-state -state war on the horizon way, that was a ridiculously expensive and wasteful way of doing defense over logistics. Cap over capacities and sure. Yeah, so, well, exactly, that's the point. So, what, so, so nobody made a bad decision in the late 90s or the early 2000s 
in switching to a just-in-time logistics mechanism and in bringing our stockpiles down to be more reflective of what we needed for the threat of the day. The problem is that a just-in-time logistics system based around a single logistic hub is two cruise missiles away from being out of action. So in the Cold War, we held vast stockpiles across numerous different sites with, a, with, with numerous different logistics chains for a reason, because from that came resilience. Now, I don't know that we can afford any nation, maybe even the United States, can't afford to completely replicate that way of doing logistics in the Cold War. And, and in any case, one would surely think that in the 30 years since, there have been advances in technology that would allow you to do it in a more productive and efficient way. But nonetheless, that hollowing out of our sort of war fighting capability was reflective of the threat of the time. But reversing that to some degree to bring credibility to our war fighting force now is the consequence of the threat of today. And that's what Ben and I are on. And if, if people come back on the command paper next week and say, oh my gosh, that is the most boring paper I've ever read. They seem more interested in ferries and rolling stock and ammo bunkers and bridges and cranes in dockyards and spares packs and, uh, you know, and, and you know, stockpiles and digitization and integration and skills and having the right people and being able to hold them in their careers for longer and to be able to harness expertise from beyond the armed forces and pull it in. We will be high-fiving. Because if you've been in the department for long enough, what you come to see quite quickly is there is a queue out of your office and down the corridor every day to sell you a plane or a tank or a ship. But what you really have to get into is the stuff that nobody ever notices. Nobody ever writes a headline over. That's the stuff that brings credibility to your warfighting capability. And that's the stuff that causes genuine deterrence. Do you think that there will be, if there, when, Hopefully, there will be a ceasefire in, in Ukraine, uh, that it will just be a kind of a temporary pause before, obviously, there needs to be a, a fresh ramping up of, of the defensive nature of the, of the forces that we have to approach, that public opinion will not be brought on side, and that um, your demands, perhaps, for a greater slice of the budget will go unheeded because there simply won't be the public opinion not just you know, with the wider public, but across government to support that? Well, I, mean, I think it's always the risk that people are most supportive of spending more on defence when they perceive the threat to be greatest. But even, even if the Ukrainian offensive were, over the next week or two, spectacularly successful, the Russians capitulated, and the war ended entirely on the terms of President Zelensky this summer, and thereafter, instead of having to debate whether to inherit a frozen conflict, everybody in NATO was content that Ukraine is a sovereign country secure in its borders, and we were able to accelerate um, NATO membership, yesterday's discussion in Vilnius notwithstanding. Um, that still isn't the end of it. You've still got a new age of global competition between great powers. Russia is one, Iran is another. China is a competitor too. Uh, there is still violent extremism spreading rapidly across sub-Saharan Africa. The world won't be immediately more secure and safe on the back of a resolution of the war in Ukraine. And thus, I think the case continues to be made for investing. But it's not a fight we still have to have. The fight has been done. In fact, it wasn't even a fight. The Secretary of State, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister have agreed that defence will get 2.5% when the fiscal conditions allow. And I think that that is the right condition to set, by the way, because I think, you know, your security, as I said earlier on, isn't just about the first echelon force that the MOD generates. It's about the resilience of your economy, the resilience of your society. And so, you know, going into a war, uh, you know, to, to think to, that the public will support 2.5% when... They're in the middle of major cost of living challenges and everything else. That, that's not a given. So get the economy right, then increase the defense budget. And in the meantime, there is a whole load of boring stuff that ministers and chiefs can get on with delivering that will make us ready for when 2.5% comes. Now, your nitty-gritty plan, focusing on interconnectors and bridges, as you're saying, is that really going to be enough if 
there is conflict in the Indo-Pacific region and the US is diverted to that. Can NATO minus the US, NATO in Europe, really counter a longer term Russian threat under the plan that you put forward? There is no NATO Europe. There's no NATO without the US. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is a club of European yes, but and obviously North American if states. I, obviously, but if, if uh, there is an, a split NATO, NATO's capabilities... There won't be divided. a split NATO. It, it, that, that's existential to NATO. And so, and I think everybody in Washington gets that. Everybody, most people in Europe get that. Um, it's only finite resources, though. Well, of course, but I think we have to be... We just have to be clear that we're not, we're not talking there about NATO carrying on whilst the US is off doing something else. We'd we'll be talking about the end of NATO. And so I think we have to be really clear that um, what the US has done over the last 18 months is shown its incredible commitment to Euro-Atlantic security. It has spent 10 times more than the UK and should be commended for having done so. Of course, the, UK, the US is increasingly seeing its pacing threat as being in the Indo-Pacific. And it'd be interesting to hear the reflections of the US general that speaks later in the morning. You, but you, I know from all my travel that that's what they focus on. But they know that their commitment to NATO is absolute. They know that there isn't a NATO without them. And what we, I think, as European countries with global reach, must be willing to do in return is show our willingness to be a security actor in the Indo-Pacific, whether or not we share the exact threat calculus that the US does or not, and not all European nations do, but to be willing to be a security actor in the Indo-Pacific is to show willing to share the US's challenge in return for their amazing continued commitment to our security challenges here in the Euro-Atlantic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you James very much. Indeed. That's a really fascinating discussion, so I do appreciate your time.